The American identity begins when Benjamin Franklin knit the American colonies together. Franklin is endlessly interesting. Printer, scientist, revolutionary. He is the only founding father who evidently had a sense of humor. Come on, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on our program. Now, there is a famous quote about you and your films that most Americans have experienced their American history through your films. That's quite a responsibility, isn't it? It, it is, but I think I'm tougher on myself in, in, the, in the long haul. I, I, I really want these to be good in and of themselves. And then if other people like them, that's important. And, and our, a very celebrated now late historian, Stephen Ambrose said, more Americans get their history from me than anyone else. And to me, it's more of a punchline. If you tell a good story and tell a complicated story, I've got a neon sign in my editing room in cursive that says it's complicated. And I just want to tell you that as filmmakers, when they got a scene that works, they don't want to change it. But we're always discovering contradictory evidence, undertow that undermines the perfection of that scene. And I want everyone disposed to be able to change it because the more complicated a story you tell, the more it resonates with people as something true. It's not comes down as doctrinaire. It doesn't have a particular bias in the moment. And because I deal in American history, history, mm. uh, you begin to realize how much the past is always present. The, the Bible said there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. That's really interesting. We'll get to Benjamin Franklin in a minute, but one thing that always struck me when I lived in America was that Americans actually revere their history so much more than we do here in Britain, even though you might think it's the other way around. I mean, you know, we have the Queen, we have the pageant, we have all that stuff, Henry VIII, but actually Americans really take their history very seriously. Is that because there's only like 250 years of it? Well, I think it's partly how how it is. I, I would just take a little bit of exception. I think they take it seriously, but they don't spend enough time investigating deeply what it is. So there's a great deal of conventional wisdom. There's a lot of superficial things. Mm. I mean, if you'd ask people about Benjamin Franklin, they'd say, oh, yes, the uh, the, the lightning has to strike the kite in mm. order for the experiment. Yeah. It, it doesn't. Yeah. Or they had no idea that he enslaved other human beings or that he became an abolitionist. Franklin is by far the most approachable of our founders. He's not somebody made of stone like a George Washington. Franklin was pretty simple in his moral code. He was driven by a desire to pour forth benefits for the common good. But there's a lot in Benjamin Franklin that makes you flinch. And we see Franklin not as a perfect person, but somebody evolving to see if he could become more perfect. And so we come around, even in the often maligned medium of television, as maligned as being superficial, and offer deep dives mm. into these stories that have everyone we meet, even um, other writers saying, I had no idea. I, I didn't mm. know that. And that, that makes us really happy if we can add to that enthusiasm mm. and that passion for our history. We do, you know, Americans like to think of themselves as exceptional. Mm. And my argument is, if you are, mm. then you've got to be harder on yourself and more truthful on yourself than anybody else. And that is not the case in the United States. We're attempting to sanitize it. We're attempting to say you can't talk about certain things mm. in any pejorative sense, like slavery. You can't mention this, you can't mention that, and, and I, that's an, an anathema uh, to me. I think a, a free country needs to have its history, warts and all. And what's so great about Benjamin Franklin is that he is a portal onto mm. our founding, warts and all. Warts and, and all, I was about really to important. say. Because you could have chosen yeah. you know, any number of the founding fathers. I mean, you could have even written a musical about a guy called Alexander Hamilton, right? Um, apparently yeah, that's been I would, you know, apparently. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I sort of felt like, yeah. <laughs> All right, so why did you choose Benjamin Franklin? Because he's arguably the most important person there at our creation. Everybody, it always goes to George Washington and with very, very good reason. But when George Washington wins, uh, when, when Cornwallis surrenders in 1881 at Yorktown in Virginia, uh, Washington's 9,000 troops have been clothed and armed by the French. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Mm. Uh, accompanying him are nearly 9,000 French soldiers. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Mm. And Cornwallis's, Lord Cornwallis's escape is blocked because there is a French fleet outside Yorktown blocking their way. Mm. He has no other choice. 
Thank you, Dr. Franklin. So Washington doesn't really win a couple of surprise battles at Trenton when he surprises mercenaries on, on, on Christmas, but he, he, he knows he can't lose a battle and he's waiting for that one moment when he wins. Yeah. That one moment is courtesy of Dr. Franklin. And then he's already helped edit the Declaration of Independence. He forges many of the compromises, some of them tragic, that ensure that the United States will be created. And then he proposes the hmm. first uh, resolution against slavery. And I haven't even talked about the fact that he's the greatest American writer, stylist hmm. of the 18th century. He's the greatest scientist in the world of the 18th century. He's, you know, an inventor, all of which he holds hmm. without patent. And he's a kid from Boston, hmm. a poor kid who's a runaway from an indentured servitude with his brother, who's now older by a, a full generation than any of the other founders, what could be more important than getting to the heart of Benjamin Franklin? And remember, the highest denomination, as you know, in circulation in the United States that people use, there are higher denominations, hmm. um, but nobody uses them, are have Benjamin Franklin, a hundred dollar bill. Yeah. And people talk about it you know, you want more Benjamins, that's mm. Americans, you know, everybody wants more Benjamins, but that's only half the pi picture because he was dedicated all his life to giving back to civic improvement, to Ely Monsonary mm. institutions, to helping create colleges and free lending libraries and philosophical societies. He understood the pluribus and the unum of our Latin mm. motto out of many one. And, and that's what I think people in the rush to make Benjamins forget about Benjamin Franklin. And I mean, as you said, it's a history of warts and all, and there were some darker sides to Benjamin Franklin, but is it a problem for American public figures today, including your presidents, when they're overshadowed by someone as brilliant as polymath, you know, as 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 talented in so many different areas as Benjamin Franklin. I mean, it's pretty annoying, yeah. isn't it? To have him peering well, over your you shoulder. Know, it, 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 it must be, uh, you know, the, the conglomeration of geniuses and wisdom and talent at, at our founding are, is astounding. But let's also remember it's a very, fairly narrow club of, of about 55 white guys, mm. uh, many of them owning other human beings at the same time they're proclaiming to the world and tis tisking everybody that we're no longer a monarchy. Uh, all men are created equal, right? But, but it's okay to own slaves and it's okay to forge compromises is where you count your slaves as three for three fifths of a person for mm. the purposes of apportionment and representation, which gives the South an undue legislative advantage, mm. but they don't have any rights whatsoever. So there's a complicated thing. Women aren't included, uh, native peoples whose land is systematically being dispossessed. And of course, those enslaved Africans are not being included mm. too. So as great as they are, I think there's a much more diverse polyglot, cosmopolitan right. America, who the current leaders are wrestling with, but they're inspired by them. When you hear Biden talk the other day, he finally signed an anti-lynching bill. Right. It's 2022. I know, that's uh, They've extraordinary. been trying to do this since the 20s, yeah. and it hasn't happened. It's been resisted and it got resistance here. It's, it's flabbergasting that in a country that has proclaimed to the world that all men are created equal, that you can't have an anti-lynching bill. So what's the relevance of someone like Benjamin Franklin for Americans today in your bitterly divided, politically divided, racially yes. divided country? Yes, well, that you, you just nailed, you, you, you just get it. He's about compromise. He starts as a young tradesman, he's a printer and the other tradesmen, he gets together, he forms a club, uh, euphemistically called the Leather Apron Club. They're the folks that work with their hands, uh, carpenters and masons and printers and things like that, carrying the type, but also, in his case, hyper-literate because he's setting words upside down and backwards. And so you have to have a, an amazing mind to, to be a great writer uh, emerging from that. He's reading everything that comes from Britain, everything there, and he's he's a polymath in that regard. But, he, the, but this club is called the Junto, after the Latin to join together. So he would say all his life, you know, remember we, we used to take two pieces of wood and we'd shave a little bit off here and shave a little bit off there, and we'd make a joint that would last for centuries. Mm. So, so far, the, the <laughs> joint that he created, the United States of America, has lasted for centuries. But that joint is really, people are now involved, they're kind of independent free agents, forgetting that freedom is not just what I want, but also what we need. Mm. He was born in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, 
which would become the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, not a state, but a Commonwealth. And he died in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So what Benjamin Franklin can offer us is a blueprint to forget, you know, people say, and I, I don't mean to be so, you know, all over the map here, but the opposite, if you ask people what the opposite of faith is, they will often say doubt. Mm. The opposite of faith is certainty. Doubt is a hugely important part of faith, mm. faith in science, faith in religion, faith in others, whatever. And so I think that Franklin has said that we need to test ourselves. And the problem today in the United States, as I think in, in Britain as well, as we see around the world, is certainty. A lot of that has to do with our social media. And I was asked by a reporter, well, Franklin, he would be aghast at social media. And I'd say, what are you talking about? He was social media. Yeah. You know, he was a printer, a publisher. He, he had almanacs out there. He was a newspaper man. He was a postmaster. He was Apple, Google, uh, mm. Twitter, and Facebook all in one. He'd get it, but he'd look at the web. I think this is me mm. channeling Benjamin Franklin. You asked me to think about what he might think about. He'd look at the web and he'd say, I observe nature. And in nature, a web is a place where you get trapped and then killed. You know, and I think he, he would he would remind yeah. us of the way in which we have been distracted and permitted a kind of certainty. And we have an old um, uh, judge, a, a, a jurist uh, named Learned Hand. And could there be a better name for a judge than Learned Hand? And he said, liberty is never being too sure you're right. We've forgotten that. He's, he's, he's channeling uh, uh, Franklin a century after Franklin, and now two centuries after him, I'm trying to channel both Learned Hand and more importantly, Benjamin Franklin to say, he could offer us with humor, mm. and that's another important, he's the first American humorist. You know, he says the proudest monarch on the proudest throne is still compelled to sit upon his own arse. <laughs> is there anyone today who in, in modern American life, or indeed elsewhere, who measures up to Benjamin Franklin? I think it's everywhere. A, a, a lot of times it is actually the units of measurement that mean the most. Like we now live in a computer world, so everything's binary, a one or a zero, and a media culture in which everything is melodramatic. You know, villains are perfectly villainous and heroes are perfectly virtuous until we learn some flaw and then they're no longer around. And what we have to understand, as the great journalist I.F. Stone said, is that history is tragedy. Your greatest writers understand that. Your greatest writer understood that in spades. It's tragedy. Nobody is perfect. Achilles has his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strengths. And so unfortunately, we don't have a kind of elastic ta uh, tolerance that permits us to actually search for and find those people among us that can mm. offer these examples. And this is where history is important. Yeah. History doesn't repeat itself, but human nature never changes. Ecclesiastes mm. says, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun, which tells us that Benjamin Franklin or a study of the Vietnam War or of jazz music or another film I did on Mark Twain or of Thomas Jefferson are, can speak directly to our moment. And while I concentrate with blinders on just wrestling complex stories to the ground, and in this case, two episodes, in the case of Vietnam, 10 episodes, when I lift up, I am stunned by the way the themes of it are resonating in the present. There's a huge section on inoculation. Yeah. Yeah. Franklin is promoting inoculation. Some people are against it. He loses his son because his son has a bad cold. And he says, we'll wait till Frankie's better before we give him the, the, the bit of smallpox. And then smallpox comes through and takes him away. Four years old, yeah. greatest loss and regret of his life. And then he has to go out in public because he is social media mm -hmm. and explain why inoculations are good and explain why he lost his son. Finally, Ken, I mean, a lot of your films, and you mentioned a few of them there, deal with the exceptionalism of America. Do you think that that exceptionalism is a blessing or a curse? It's a curse and a blessing, of course, as in everything, just as Franklin has the good sides and bad sides, as I do, as you do. Well, and how is it a curse, do you think? To say complicated human being is redundant. It's a curse because it sets us up to be myopically 
arrogant about what we've done and what we've contributed. And if you're myopically arrogant, you're unwilling to go back into your past or to examine your present and understand the flaws that you have and do something to correct them. And so if you're uh, exceptional to the exception of understanding what exceptional it is, you don't actually rise farther. You can't suggest to the world better things. Now, this doesn't happen. This is fits and starts. I would argue that the United States government has been one of the greatest forces for good in the history of humankind. And I could list those accomplishments beginning Many with Many people the would disagree with you there. Of course they would. And I could point out equally, as my films have equally, all the places where that same institution has screwed up, shall I say, royally, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, but they're, they're, they both coexist. And so this is what I've tried in all mm. of my, look, let me just freely admit, I've made the same film oh, over for made the same film Sometimes they're an hour long, sometimes in this case, four hours with Benjamin Franklin, 18 hours in Vietnam. You know, I've made the same film over and over again. Each film asks a deceptively simple question. Who are we? That is to say, who are those strange and complicated people, complicated people who like to call themselves Americans? And what does an investigation of the past tell us about not only where we've been, but where we are and where we may be going? Well said. Wonderfully complicated. Ken Burns, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you.